Hi guys, this is Studio Slave, and in this video we're going to be making a few different types of drum racks so we can implement our drum layering a little bit easier and also to keep our drums nice and tidy when we're working in clip view. So when we drag a load of samples onto a drum rack and we only use a few of them, you see when we fold this drum rack then we still have all of our samples so we can't really see exactly what's going on. So our drum racks are going to solve this problem and also make our drum layering workflow a little bit more efficient. So here I've just got a drum rack with a sampler device in it and I'll show you how to do this with Simpler as well a bit later on and I've just grouped this with itself so now we've got our chain and our macro controls within this pad. So I'm just going to rename this our layer rack and that will update in the pad as well. So because this is a layer rack we need to have some control over our layers and how we manipulate them. So we'll go to the gain first, we're going to map the chain volume to macro 1, we'll rename this to gain. And then we're going to go into our map, uh, macro map settings and we're going to just set this to have a maximum of zero. And then we just push this up to zero so we can hear our sample. So now that we've mapped that we can just hide the chain and we need to get a bit of tonal control over our layers. So what we're going to do is we're going to use an EQ8 and we're going to place this after the sampler within the same chain. Because we're layering we only really need uh, top level control over the low cut and high cut filters. So I'm going to set the high cut to a little bit more gentle one, just so it's not quite so abrupt. And the low cut, I'm going to keep on a four pole. And I'm just going to map these two frequency controls to macro two and macro three. And then we can rename these low cut and high cut filter. And the last thing we need to do is just push our high cut all the way up so it's fully open again. So it's in a neutral position for when we're layering. And then we can just hide the EQ8 device to keep things nice and tidy. Next up, we're going to want a bit of control over the compression of each of our layers. So for this, I'm going to use the glue compressor. I'll use some fairly standard settings. We'll go for an attack of 3 milliseconds, a standard release, and we'll go for a 4 to 1 ratio. And then all we have to do is map the threshold and the makeup gain to macro 4. And if I just show you at the moment, if I use this macro 4, it's not quite working as we want it to because we've got the threshold and the makeup gain working together. So all we do is we go into our macro mapping settings and we invert the range of our threshold. And this means that as the threshold comes down, the makeup gain is also going to come up to compensate for it. Next up, we need to add in our standard sampler controls for a little bit of shaping. So all we're going to do here is go to our filter global tab. We're going to map our attack to macro five and we're going to map our decay to macro six. And then we need to reduce the sustain because it's going to be attack decay envelope. So we don't need the sustain. We're then going to go into our pitch os tab and we can map our transposition as well, which is our pitch. So we can map that to macro seven. And then all we have to do is we have to go into our macro mappings, we just rename these to attack, decay and pitch. And then we're going to get some more sensible values. So because we're using drum samples here for our attack, we'll go for a maximum of two seconds, which is 2000 milliseconds. For our decay, we'll go for five seconds, which is 5000 milliseconds. And for our pitch, we're going to go plus or minus 12 semitones, which is more than enough when it comes to pitching, because any more than that, and it starts to make the samples sound really warped. The last thing we've got to do is just remember to push up our decay as a neutral setting for our drum rack, because otherwise we're not actually going to hear the drum sample with a one millisecond decay. As well as that, we also need to set our pitch to zero as well. Next, we need to add some samples to our new rack. So we can do this in two ways. We can either do this using the chains, which means dropping our samples here, so it will end up being a parallel chain of samples, and then we can use the chain selector knob. Or the other way we can do it is using the zones, which is how we're going to do it in this case, so we get full macro control over every single one of our samples at the same time. So to add in our samples, we'll just go to the desktop, and I've got a pack of kicks here that you can get as part of this project. I'll just select all of these, we've got 121 of them, and drag them into the zone area here. And if we go to the selection here, you can see we've got all the way up to 127 different kicks that we can have. So that's the maximum, but in this case, we've only got 121. So I'm going to show you a little trick to make sure that your chain selector only goes up to 121. And then if you want to add an extra kicks, then you can do. All you've got to do is remember to change your chain selector and redistribute the values, which I'll talk about in a second. So now with all the samples selected, I'm going to drag these blue bars to 120 that makes up our 121 samples from zero right click and distribute the ranges equally and this now means that we have a sample selection for every single sample apart from this very uh, last one here so we could either drag this out like we have done here 
or there is a slightly better way. So what we're going to do is we're going to map our chain selector here and we're going to map this to macro 8. So now this sample selector can flick through these samples. And like I said, we've got one per sample. So to sort out our problem that we have here at the end, we go into our macro mappings and we change this to 120 from 127. So now the sample selector stops at 120. So like I said, as you add your samples, make sure you change this and also change the distribution of ranges of all your samples as well. So this is a really good way of having all your samples collated together in one place. So now to show you this working as a quick demonstration, I'm just going to create a MIDI clip and we're going to put in a very simple kick pattern, a four on the floor. And then we'll just test that all of our controls work. And then we can rename this rack to tones and then we can duplicate this and we can call another rack transients and then we can work with these two racks even though it's the same kicks in each rack and we can create tones and transients to fit together between the two racks and that means that we can blend different kicks together to get a more powerful unified kick in this case i have made this for kick drum layering but there's no reason why you couldn't apply this exact same principle to things such as snares or claps as well so now I'm just going to go into the MIDI clip and I'm going to add in the transient MIDI as well. So I'll just copy this up and then I'll just demonstrate how we could use this for layering purposes. So if I was going to use this drum rack, what I would do is I'd use the bottom four pads for my kick. So I might have my sub body and transients. The next lineup would be for my different clap layers. And then the next lineup would be for my hat layers. And that keeps everything nice and compact. And when we're working in clip view, it means we're not going to see loads of different samples that we don't need to see. So a small downfall with doing this is that all of these samples here within our zones, they're all being referenced from different WAV files. So if we go to manage our project, and we have a look, you can see we've got 121 files from elsewhere. So it's got to reference all of these files, which can slow down the loading speed. So what we can do is we can collect those into the project, but we can actually do this a slightly more powerful way, which is by only referencing one single file. So to show you how to do this, I've just got a plain drum rack again with a sampler device on it. And I suggest you only do this with your favorite go-to sample library that you've built up over time, because it does take a bit of time to set this up, but it is really worth it in the end. So what we're going to do is we're going to drag in some kick samples and the important thing to know here is to set the grid quantization to a quarter note or the same length as your kick samples because they've all got to be the same length. So when we drag this in we can either have them on the same track or if we press alt we can have them on individual tracks but in this case we want them on the same track and they're all the exact same distance apart. So what we can now do is we can look through and get rid of any kicks we don't like. So I've got a reverse kick in here somewhere that I'm going to get rid of. I'm just going to make sure that they all have the exact same gap between them and they all have the exact same time length. So once we've sorted out this little situation at the end, I'm just going to pull these across. So the gap is the same and then I'm going to consolidate these kicks together. But before I do that, I'm going to set the project tempo to 120 beats per minute. And this is quite important because of how it's going to work when we divide down into seconds with our sampler in a second. And then we consolidate our favorite kick drums together. And then we're going to bring this into our sampler device. And then what we have to do is we have to change the length in samples and we have to change this to seconds. So now that we've done this, we can use the sample start and sample end to isolate each of our individual samples. So before you start duplicating the different zones, make sure you set this first. So we'll just set our first sample. And because we know the exact timings of each of these samples, these are going to work out absolutely spot on. So once we've done this, we then go to the zone and we duplicate this. And then all we do is we add one to the sample end first 
and then we add another one to the sample start first. And make sure you do it uh, the end first and then the start. Otherwise, you get this 999 problem that you just seen me have here. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do this for every single one of our samples really quickly. And this is the part that takes a bit of time. But once it's done, it's going to save a lot of loading speed and a lot of drama when you lose some of your samples as you move them from different projects or different computers. So now the final thing is just to select all of our samples, pull the bar down to 120 samples, and then distribute the ranges equally. And then we can just map our sample selector. And if it doesn't let you map it, then just make sure to group your sampler device with itself so you have access to the macro controls. And then you can map this to whatever macro you want. So we'll go for macro 8. So we can map the rest of the macros for control a little bit later on. And like I said, this is the exact same function as any of the other racks, apart from we've now managed to house all of our different samples into one single file. So Ableton only has to reference the single file. So if we just rename this to favorite kicks, what we can now do is we can save this to our user library and it's now only got to save the single file. So it's a lot harder to lose it or lose any of the files when we're moving them around between different computers, different projects, or collaborating with someone. So just to show you how this would work, I'm just going to duplicate this rack across a few of the different pads. And then if we go into clip view, then what you can see is it allows us to only see the different samples that we're using. However, we still get control of being able to choose any sample we want from our favorite collection. And then further to that, we can control the actual groove of individual layers and we can move these backwards or forwards, which can either enhance the groove or we can use this to give us a little bit more headroom as well. So for the final part of the video, I'm going to be building the exact same rack, but I'm going to do this using the simpler device for those of you that don't have the sampler. So we'll start off the same way with a drum rack and we're just going to put a simpler on one of the pads. And then just as normal, we're going to group this simpler device with itself. And rather than using zones, which we don't have in the simpler, we're going to place our kick samples in the parallel chain. So we're going to have a kick chain for each of our individual kick samples. So firstly, let's just map some controls as we do normally. So here we're just going to go for gain, pitch, attack and decay. And remember to pull the sustain all the way down as well. Next, we're going to rename the macro controls and set them appropriately in the macro mapping panel. Next, we drag all of our kicks into the chains area. A handy little tip now that we have all of our kicks in the chain is to make sure this little chain selection button is pressed. So this means that when we've mapped our chain selector, as we flick through the different kicks, it's going to update the waveform visually. So now we we'll just go to the chain selector. Select all of the kicks, drag them out so we're at 120. Then we're going to map our chain selector to one of our macro controls once we've distributed our ranges. And now we have full control over our different kicks and we can see that visually. And I'll just show you that now. As we change between our different kick drums, we get the visual waveform updating and we don't get this with the zones. So this is a handy little tip if you're going to use chains. There is a slight problem with this method though. And what happens is if we look at our very first kick, our macro controls for our attack and decay and pitch are only working on that first kick. So what we need to do is we need to right click the mapped parameter and we need to select map to all siblings from the drop down menu. If you don't have this map to all siblings function, then you need to add an options.txt file into Ableton, which you can do. You just have to look at the Ableton forum to be able to do this. But if not, then you're going to have to do this manually for each one of your chains. But what this does is it just automatically maps every single one of your kick chains so it has the same functions and so all your macro controls are going to work. Some people don't actually like this method though and they will prefer to just dive in and set these manually but I think it's much quicker just to make sure they're all automatically mapped. So you can just dive straight in and you can audition your samples as you want them to be with the correct attack, decay and pitch settings. If you want the samples and the racks that I've made within this project then check out the download link that's in the description and please make sure to click the subscribe button and check out our website studioslave.com.